This is a reading from the Gospel of Luke, from the 18th chapter. Jesus told his friends a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He said to them, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to the judge and saying, Grant me justice against my accuser. For a while the judge refused, but later changed course, saying, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to God's beloved ones who cry out to God day and night? Will the Holy One delay long in helping them? I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? Beloved church, will you pray with me? God bless our hearing of these your words. Help us to set ourselves in this story as our story and know what your will and our work is. Amen. There are so many entry points to this parable from Jesus that touch our lives directly, immediately, today. Some parables are a little more work to translate into 21st century American culture, but this one to me seems easy. First, is anyone here bothered about unjust judges? Say amen. amen. Raise your hands in the air. Next, given the secularization of society in some zip codes and the violent, violent cultification of Christianity in others, if Jesus did come back, do you wonder if he would find the kind of faith that he taught? Say amen. And finally, does anyone feel like no matter how much they pray for a particular person or situation, no matter airtight and noble your prayer, you feel that those prayers are falling on deaf ears. Say amen. Say amen if you've lost heart at any time over the last six months, six minutes to six years. Say amen if you see too many people who have no fear of God, of the God they say they believe in, nor any respect for other people. Say amen if you feel the pain of that widow knocking her knuckles bloody on the gates of injustice. Jesus is talking to us. The protagonist is a widow, but she stands in for any vulnerable person. And we have many vulnerable people in our world. Widows in Jesus' day had few rights. They couldn't inherit money. They, couldn't, they had no means of working to earn a living. They had to beg and beg for any scrap of justice, just like so many vulnerable people do in our wounded and wounding world. Jesus says that God is not an unjust judge, that God will grant her chosen ones, whoever that is, their due. And if we have not yet received justice, we might wonder if we are not the chosen ones after all. Or perhaps God's definition of justice is different from ours. Or perhaps God's sense of swiftness is different from ours. It reminds me of the stewardship joke. A man was speaking to God and he asked her, God, is it true that to you a thousand years is like a minute? That's true, God replied. And is it true that to you a million dollars is like a penny? That's true, God said. Well, you see, I'm a poor man, and I was wondering if you could give me a penny. 
asked the man. Sure, said God, in a minute. (laughs) If God and we differ on our ideas of justice and timing and chosenness, perhaps we can at least agree on the meaning of another word repeated in this parable, respect. First, to put us in the mood, Yella. You know it, sing it. What you want, baby, I got it. What you need, you know I got it. What does respect even mean? It's one of those words, those squirrely words, like trust or forgiveness. It's really hard to pin down. You know it when you experience it. There is a phrase, demand respect, but in truth, you really can't. Trust is organic. You feel it or you don't. But it turns out you can practice respect. Father Richard Rohr, the Franciscan mystic and teacher, blew my mind this week. That's nothing new. He does that all the time. But he did it in the simplest way, by unpacking the word respect. In his daily meditation, he said, the word respect means to look at a second time. Re speculate, respect. It's as simple as that. And as an amateur etymologist, I was miffed that I had never figured it out before. To discover respect for another person or any created thing, all we have to do is look at it again. Or Martin Buber might say, not look at it, but look at thou. A second gaze, a third, a fourth. Roar expands on how this specking helps us, our thous, and the world. He says, I'm afraid our first gaze at anything is always utilitarian. We tend to think, what's in it for me? What can I get out of it? How will this affect me? Does this make me look good? Will this give me pleasure? He goes on, if we don't recognize the narrowness and the emptiness of that gaze, it will keep us forever at the center of a very small world. And let's admit we all start there. Only after God has taught us how to live undefended can we immediately stand with and for others and for the moment. He says, it's taken me much of my life to begin to have the second gaze. By nature, I have a critical mind and a demanding heart, and I am so impatient. These are both my gifts and my curses, yet it seems I cannot have one without the other. They are both good teachers. A life of solitude and silence allows them both and invariably leads me to the second gaze, the gaze of compassion Looking out at life from the place of divine intimacy is all I really have and all I have to give, although I don't always do it. Roar urges solitude and silence, which are both great teachers, but in the parable, Jesus makes a hero of the widow who does the exact opposite. She does not pray quietly for respect, She keeps showing up to demand it. Something very similar happened to a friend of mine recently. Her name is Reverend Kaji Dosha. She's a UCC minister and a fellow writer for the Still Speaking Daily Devotionals, and she is, can I say this? She is a, she is, oh, I can't say that with kids in the room. (laughs) She is cut in the mold of the widow. She'll also be here in person in February to preach for us. So if you are moved by the story I'm about to tell, you can tell her so in person. Kaji is a pastor of a storied church in New York City, but her last church was in San Diego, where she made border justice a key focus of her call. 
And even after moving to New York, she continued her work at the border. During one of the crises, she flew there to help the growing number of people facing humanitarian disaster there. But when she tried to cross back into the US as a black woman wearing a clergy collar, she was detained by Customs and Border Protection. She was put into a windowless room and interrogated. Eventually, the government took away her border crossing privileges and instructed the Mexican government to arrest and detain her on the Mexican side of the border the next time she was there for her ministry, helping migrants. It was a clear attempt to cow her as a woman, as a black woman, as a black woman of the cloth who had the audacity to stand with people even more vulnerable than she was. She was eventually released from that room, but put on a government watch list. They retaliated against her for her ability to draw attention and compassion to the migrants our government was treating disgracefully. Her picture was leaked, we have a picture, opening her up to doxing and harassment. The Department of Homeland Security, of which Customs and Border Protection is an arm, didn't yet know that you don't mess with Kaji Dosha. She lawyered up, she spoke to the press, something she is exceptionally good at, saying, my country has decided to punish me, but I will not look away. I will continue to look closely, to listen, to imagine, and to call us into a better way. Free me and my colleagues to do our work with migrants, and we will find that better way. In 2019, after the incident, she filed a lawsuit against the DHS for interfering with her legal right to provide spiritual support and pastoral services to migrants and refugees at the border. And the suit finally came to trial just a few weeks ago. The judge assigned to the case was appointed by Donald Trump. One of the lawyers for the DHS cross-examined her on the stand in this way. He made a grandstanding statement about how polished and eloquent and glamorous she was when she appeared in the national news media to talk about her case. Kaji does rock a red lip like nobody I know. <laughs> the lawyer's implication seemed to be if she could present so well, surely she had not suffered trauma by being detained and harassed by her own government. Kaji did not present the image of a wounded, aggrieved, and broken person, but we all know how trauma can hide how we can hide it even from ourselves, projecting strength as we attempt to move through the world. The cross-examiner went on his slick tirade about how well Kaji presented and finally fell silent. She checked in with God, she stared coolly back at him, and she said not a word. After an uncomfortable minute, the lawyer said, are you going to answer the question? And Kaji, without missing a beat, said, are you going to ask one? Dr. Will Gaffney, who wrote the women's lectionary to give us a second gaze at the Bible, wrote of this parable. Though the scriptures regularly present widows as vulnerable victims and potential victims, the widow in Luke 18 demonstrates the persistence and resourcefulness of women in womanist parlance to make a way out of no way and survive until they can thrive. Dr. Gaffney reminds us that the phrase uttered by the judge in the parable that's usually translated, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out. Well, that wear me out literally is so that she may not give me a black eye. The widow was making the judge look bad. That's why he gave her justice. By showing up in her integrity, he actually made himself look bad. She had nothing to do with it. He gave himself that black eye, amen? In Kaji's case, the, judge, the judge's decision is still pending. 
But when I saw her a couple of weeks ago, she looked lighter than I have seen her in years and said as much. She said, I didn't know how much all of this was weighing me down until it was over. She knows that whatever the, judges, the judge decides, she vindicated herself in court that day. She showed up with as much moxie and right on her side as the widow in Jesus' parable. Kaji spent years pursuing justice, making them look at her again and again, demanding respect, a second gaze, a third gaze, a fourth. And whatever happens from here on out, perhaps even the unjust judges and Border Patrol and DHS bureaucrats will think twice about locking up black women clergy or separating families at the border or trafficking legit asylum seekers to liberal states as a joke just because she made it a little harder for them to carry out their heinous schemes. There are so many roles in this parable, and we probably do well not to always identify exclusively with the eye-blackening heroine. We may be her sometimes, God willing, but we may also be the unjust judge, not looking twice at a person who deserves to be seen or a whole group of people in their complexity. We might have an unjust judge in our own hearts who won't let us rest, who undermines our self-esteem and self-respect. We may be Jesus encouraging others to pray and not lose heart despite how God seems to lag in arriving. Or we may be the city dwellers walking distracted by the courthouse without a thought to what's happening inside. This parable gives us many ways to keep looking at our lives and our life together. All flesh. Amen.